Welcome back to Southern Woke. I'm Marina. And I'm Kaylin. And, uh, welcome back. Oh, and boy, do we have one for y'all today. Yeah. We're getting back into the true crime. Last week, we kind of took it chill. I mean, last, last week. Uh, that always trips me up, how we record every other week, because yeah. I always just refer to last. There's no last, good last. way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But today, we're getting back into the true crime, and... Maybe some of y'all have heard of this one, maybe you haven't. It is a solved case, but it was a cold case for a very long time. It is that of April Marie Tinsley. She was an eight-year-old that uh, some really bad things happened to. But, like, 30 years after everything went down, science solved the case. And this case has been, like, on our list of cases we've wanted to do for so, so, so long. I don't know how it's taken us 30 episodes to finally get to it, but here I we know. are. And I, of course, I first heard about it when I started binging Crime Junkie back in the day. Same here. And then I was, like, taking some biology class, and we had to do a presentation. And I was, like, the odd one out because I did, like, this whole crime forensic biology thing and tried to turn this case into, like, so much science I probably, like, bored the heck out of them, but... I did that in one of my communication classes, turned into a true crime thing. It was pretty great. Mm-hmm. All right, well, let's hop right into the case today, and our case is taking us to Fort Wayne, Indiana, where eight-year-old April Tinsley lived. And right off the bat, Fort Wayne, Indiana just gives me bad vibes. I feel like I've heard of so many cases there. Like, you have you ever heard of the two girls that went missing on that bridge in, like, Delphi or yes. something? Yes. I think that's what it was called. I don't know. But it was somewhere nearby. It's the same state, at least. I know that. Everything bad happens in Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. And I kind of like... I think this is another reason why I feel so drawn to this case. I don't know. But April was born on March 18th, which is my birthday. But of course, in 1980. But um, we were both Pisces. And she was a bright little girl living with her mom dad and little brother and also side note did you know her mom she was actually pregnant with twins when she was pregnant with april but the little boy died three months before giving birth and she had to like carry that other one with april so she had already gone through a loss of one child only to do it again eight years later all right well april was eight years old whenever all of this happened she was outside playing with her friends on a wet and overcast evening now I remember whenever I was eight year olds, we had like a group of neighborhood friends where we always hung out together and there really wasn't parental supervision. Like our parents would be inside, but we we're like, hey, we're going outside, we're going to play with the neighbors. And then we would just travel back and forth from all of our houses and we just knew we would be home at a certain time at the end of the night. And it was just a normal thing to do. Well, it did start to finally rain on them and she realized that she left her umbrella at her friend's house, which was just right around the corner from her own house. So without even thinking twice, she walked around the corner to her friend's house to go pick up the umbrella. Yeah, and, but she never made it there. So around, like, after it got to be, like, 4 o'clock, April's mom was starting to worry. Like, usually April's pretty good about coming home one time, and she knew it was about to rain and all this stuff. So she calls her friend Nicole's mom's phone and acts like, have you seen... April and she said no she never came back to get her umbrella it's still here so then Janet did I already es establish that April's mom's name is Janet I don't remember but there you go um so Janet starts the panic and calls well first she goes to talk to the friends and figures out okay so she was going to get the umbrella but never made it there so then they call the police and they have like 200 or so people began a search because they already like off the bat assumed it was an abduction because it happened so fast I cannot imagine that feeling of your daughter walking on a corner and she just never makes it to where she's intended to go it's like I will let my dog out sometimes to go use the bathroom and I'll step inside to like grab my phone or something real fast and if I come back out and don't immediately see him I just freak out see, so like, I having would, that happen with a child I would never even do that I'm way <laughs> too paranoid I would never let Kaza out in this apartment complex and no like literally I brought her to a McDonald's drive through one time and the dude wanted to like have her through the window I'm like no oh Kaza's <laughs> so cute we're gonna have to show her on the show one day 
Yeah, well, like whatever the next National Dog Day is, we'll just post on our I'm down Southern Woods. <laughs> Alright, so she calls the police, and she's kind of freaking out, and it doesn't take long at all for them to assemble a search team of volunteers from around the neighborhood. Around 75 policemen, as well as locals from the neighborhood, set out on foot and in vehicles trying to locate the little girl. And this is according to True Crime Edition. But of course, as the sun went down, April still was not home. Although, three witnesses came forward. One... And, like, the reports of this are kind of spotty because, like, you kind of hear different things from different articles and sources and all of that. But one was apparently a younger girl that described seeing April being forced into a battered blue pickup truck by a white man in his 30s with light brown hair and facial stubble between, like, 3 and 4 o'clock. The other witness was an elderly lady who is now deceased and she said she saw a blue pickup truck with multiple men inside lapping around the neighborhood. And the last witness said she saw a little blonde girl walking on the side of the road wearing, like, the exact clothes that April was described missing in. Like, she was wearing, like, pants with um, three hearts on it, a turtleneck, and a red jacket. And she saw that girl tried to cross the street when a blue pickup truck pulled next to her, but April didn't look scared, so she assumed everything was okay, and then they were gone. And she said it was a white man, about 150 pounds, with blondish, sandy hair. So, it was seen. Why did nobody stop it? But I guess, like, that's the confusing thing, is, like, why did nobody hear a scream? Why did, like, was it really that fast? Like, some people say, like, did they chloroform her? Was it really multiple people? Well, so they take this information they got from the little girl's testimony about the guy with the facial stubble, and they make a composite sketch, which, have you seen the sketch? I'm sure you have. Yeah. It is the most vague looking, it could literally be anybody. Like, you yeah. could somehow compare it to me if you really wanted to. It's just <laughs> a very vague looking sketch, and of course, it really didn't help anybody. No. And... April's mom was even like, like, she more so believed that it could have been multiple men because she isn't convinced one man pulled over, got out, and snatched her up so fast without making a scene, considering there was actually a crew of men working kind of like adjacent across the street from where it was said to take place. Um, and they didn't even notice anything. They didn't, which, I mean, if they're working, they're probably like zoned out, but I don't know. That's just more eyes that were out there that didn't see anything, like, major take place. Especially if it's only one person that's actually abducting somebody. There's no way you can, like, quietly, like, get out of yeah, the car and be like, you have to stop. Get yeah. car, go around the vehicle to, like, well, someone said she was just crossing the street. So who knows where she was in the street. She could have just been crossing and then, <laughs> Yeah. But, I don't know. You would think that would be more known if it was really a snatch. Because then, like, those people would have been like, okay, that's not normal. Yeah. I just want to know, how did she get in this vehicle? So bad. Or she believes that it could be someone that April knew because she was a very shy girl and wouldn't willingly just go with a stranger and no one heard any screaming, so maybe she knew the person and felt comfortable going with them. But that's a bunch of what ifs. Well, we don't really get any leads or breaks in case whatsoever until around... 3 p.m. on April 4th. A jogger's running through DeKabal County in Spencerville, which is about 20 minutes from where April was abducted, and the jogger noticed something in a ditch, and upon closer inspection realized that it was a body. Police arrived on the scene and identified the body as that of April Tinsley. The girl appeared to have been killed elsewhere and then dumped into the ditch, and an autopsy eventually indicated that Tinsley had been sexually molested and suffocated. She had been dead for nearly two days when her body was discovered. And because her body was dumped in the middle of the day, police came up with a theory that it had to have been a local person that knew the area well. Yep. It is so unfortunate because, like, the scene had to have been, like, the most, like, gut-wrenching and, like, sick thing because what was found near the body was a plastic Sears bag and the police didn't describe or say anything about this to the public for years. They kept this in the police station. I don't even think April's mom knew about it. But in the Sears bag, there was this, like, 
big penis shaped sex toy and it had a metal crank at the end of it like what kind of sick shit is that and like it had the killer's dna on it so at least they gave the police his dna because hold on to that because that will solve the case later and you have to remember the years 1988 dna testing was like very very primitive back then the main it was just not starting off but the main sources of testing was like fingernail testing or blood or hair we weren't really just like pulling dna off of random objects at the time but at least people had the know it how to just store some of that DNA evidence away until we got better, which thank God they did that. Yeah, and also some clues at the scene that led them to believe that she was unfortunately sexually assaulted was that she was fully clothed, but her underwear and her socks were inside out, and they constantly asked her mom, like, did you do that? Like, would you ever put her stuff inside out? And she was like, no. And... Also, another thing is she only had one shoe on. Her other shoe was found on the other side of the road, about 800 feet away, and they assumed that the killer got back in his truck, realized it was in there, and then threw it out the window. And hold on to that, too, because that comes back into play, too, because they never told the public about that shoe, either. Let's see, am I missing anything about this crime scene? And if you are new to true crime, I knew it took me a minute to catch on to this when I was first starting out. The police purposely leave out certain details about cases. That way they can use it to confirm if it's an actual real confession or not. Because there's something called like false confessions and like fake oh, confessions yeah. where people just com like confess to crimes that they didn't do. And it makes no sense, but it's super interesting. So they have to leave certain pieces of evidence out. That way, the only way you would actually know that is if you actually did commit it. Yeah. And as far as I know, only one witness came forward the next day on April 5th and said that they saw a blue truck just chilling in the road for a minute. And so... And so they kept talking about this battered, beat-up blue truck. So the police began, like, investigating, of course, first with the family and collected DNA samples. And Janet got a lot of shit for failing a polygraph test. But that just goes to show you, like, obviously this mom did not do this to her daughter. And it goes to show you that when you're under emotional stress, like, of course you can fail a polygraph test. I hate polygraphs. I think it's like a fake science and we just need to get rid of it. Like, I know. It like, really drives me crazy at this point. Like, in normal circumstances, yeah, I'm sure you could tell if a person is lying or telling the truth. But, like, in situations where you have a hysterical mom that's failing one and then a calm cool and collected killer that can pass yeah. one like you can't rely on it that's why i'm glad like more so courts don't use that as evidence anymore i agree so yeah so janet got a lot of shit for failing that polygraph and there were rumors in town saying that she only wanted sons so she killed april but like, little did they know her story about the twin. Like, she always knew, like, her first daughter, she was going to name April Tenzit or April, April Marie. And, like, she was a great mother. And these people are just talking their crap. And I just want to go and punch all of them in the face. But... Can you imagine griefing the loss of your daughter? And... Or the abduction of your daughter? And then people are sitting there saying, you probably did it. That is so awful. Yeah, like, obviously she didn't... I'm just making so <laughs> angry. But, um, let's see. So, we're now on April 6th, which is one or two days after the body was found, and the police are beginning to intensify their search for this light blue battered pickup truck, because that is literally the only solid lead that they have at the time. And they even begin exploring a possible connection between Tinsley's abduction and the disappearance of a nine-year-old girl who was taking on, taken on March 31st, which was taken just five days before April was abducted. Yeah, I did hear about that case, but I didn't write anything down about it. Do you have more? That's all I have on that one. They were trying to link it. I guess they never did. Yeah, they. the police, I remember them mentioning, like, were pretty positive that this was just a coincidence and it really had nothing to do with their case. But also, just to go to show how shitty the community was. Well, I also, well, they weren't all shitty because a lot of people did, like, crowd around the family and were yeah. great to them. But, this story, 
April, after April was found, Janet had to go identify the body at the morgue, of course, so she brought some people for support. But only Janet and a priest were allowed to actually go in. And she was only shown the top half of April, and she knew it was her, of course. As Janet walked out, she couldn't talk. She cried for a really long time. No one could console her, and that memory always haunts her. Janet hadn't eaten in two days, so the people she brought with her brought her to eat. And I can only imagine, like, because I know that sh they said this happened at, like, 2 a.m. They had to go in. So they probably were, like, at a Waffle House or, like, IHOP or something. And the customers in the restaurant were, like, looking at her weird, asking why she's crying, like, telling her to shut up and all this weird, like, just rude shit. And Janet just, like, kind of snapped and was like, y'all want to know what's wrong? I just identified my 8-year-old dead daughter's body, like, so y'all can get the flu I would have got a murder charge in that exact moment. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my god. I would have just left, like... Mm -mm. But at least she did have some people that weren't completely shitty. Um, so while the police were following the feelings that they had, April's family held a memorial service for her, for her, and over 150 mourners gathered at Faith United Methodist Church that day for Tenley's service. Yeah. The community really did, like... They tried so hard to, like, keep this case in the headlines. Like, every anniversary, they would run another news cycle, like, anything they could to help the family out and try to find the killer. So, let's see. The autopsy revealed that April was indeed sexually assaulted and the cause of death was suffocation by strangulation. She had been dead for 24 to 48 hours and police made a comment on how she could have been held captive and tortured for up to three days. And it's their best guess that she died on Easter Sunday and then the killer disposed of her body the next morning around 11 a.m. But it seemed like she was killed at a different location and then just like disposed in a ditch like 40 feet from the road. What kind of landscape is that? A ditch 40 feet away from the road? That doesn't make sense. That is really weird, don't you think about that? <laughs> Alright y'all, so we are now seven days after her abduction. We're on April 11th, and police finally announced that there is a little bit of progress in the case. They've taken in a 34-year-old man for questioning in Tinsley's murder after more than 140 people call Crime Stoppers to report that the man resembles the composite sketch. Now. That is kind of crazy. Imagine looking so much like that composite sketch that 140 people call and say that you look like this. That is, yeah. that is so weird to me. But that's what ended up happening. Um, the callers also reported that the man had talked to friends about having knowledge of Tinsley's death and that a blue pickup truck had been parked outside of his home several times. After interrogating the man for eight hours, Fort Wayne police charged him in a different case the molestation of an 11-year-old girl from the year prior. Police took his blood and hair samples and compared these with ones found from Tinsley's body. Do you have anything else on him for? Yeah. So, also the reason why they wanted to question him so bad is that this dude literally went to a party and was telling people the whole sock situation and the shoe situation, I think and like exactly what kind of clothes she was wearing and people at the party were like this dude was talking about this girl's murder and he knew way too much like that also happened so he really seemed like their best suspect and i always say this all the time but can you imagine like being at a party and somebody just walking around talking about a girl that he murdered like what type of parties are y'all going to dude i feel like it probably happens often because i oh back where i'm from in the country back in redneck town i could so see those rednecks walking around at a party saying like oh yeah i shot so and so because <laughs> like i've heard it be done before no shade lots of tea but anyways okay <laughs> well Unfortunately, he ends up getting released from prison about a year le later, and he's acquitted of all charges on the other molestation charge, and they could not link him to anything with April's case. Yeah, so that was super unfortunate. But that doesn't exclude some of the theories out there, because maybe his DNA didn't match, because he didn't just, like, 
because I think the DNA evidence they got was from the sexual assault. But maybe he was just the one that kidnapped her because everyone says he looks just like the sketch and the sketches of the guy that yeah. kidnapped her. And maybe they were just working together and then this sick dude was involved. I mean, they're both sick dudes, but who knows? It's just a theory. But also, so Everett stopped talking to police. Did you already say he was released from jail after mm -hmm. that? Okay. So he stopped talking to police and a few weeks after April's funeral, he was rushed to the hospital and was put in a coma. One day, the doctors reduced the coma, and he said he wanted to talk to the police, and when the police showed up, it sounded like Everett was about to say something valuable, and then he died in his last breath, like a movie. And after this, the police believed the same as Janet, that he could have definitely known something about that case, but they'll never know. And then, also, there was another suspect... And I don't know if this is the same guy, because they have, like, some things in common. But apparently this guy's nickname was Moose, and he was known as being in a local gang and looked like the sketch as well. And witnesses picked him in a lineup, but that was kind of it. He didn't own a blue pickup, but he had easy access to one, and people said he would go up to kids at parks and say inappropriate things and scare them. And people said his gang was sometimes associated with satanic cults, but there was no real evidence of that. But from there, the police get, like, this theory of devil worship and that whoever took her has to be somehow involved, like, in the occult. And they have, like, this whole witch hunt between looking for devil worshippers and the occult for a while. It's kind of cringe. Yeah, because in that time period, like, the whole satanic cult was, like, something people were so afraid of, which, yeah. I mean, you should always be afraid of a satanic <laughs> cult but it was kind of like i don't know trendy back then cringe <laughs> okay and unfortunately y'all we end up getting to kind of like a stall in the investigation at this point it just dies out we can't find any more leads we don't have any information on anybody we can't do anything with the dna that we have at the time and so we just have like a two-year silence period but little did we know this would be the shortest silent period we have, but... Yes. <laughs> and then we get brought to the barn. And I remember the first time I heard about this, this was one of, this still stands out to me more than almost any true crime thing. It is just so horrifying. <laughs> so, two years passed. We're now at July 7th, 1990, and police find a message written on a St. Joseph Township barn door. The message reads, and the messages are, like, very misspelled, but what they're trying to say is, I kill April Marie Tinsley, and I kill again. They're written in awful handwriting, giving them a very eerie look. And the message came just three weeks before seven-year-old Sarah Jean Boker of Fort Wayne also went missing and was found murdered, just as a interesting fact to put in there. But... That is kind of insane. A man who lived near the barn, um, as True Crime Edition reports, had seen a man return to the area several times, and each time the message became more and more prominent. Police never specified how they knew, but they confirmed that the message was consistent with what they believed to be the killer's handwriting. Which, I still don't understand how they really know that. But, despite having a witness, no leads were ever made. The killer stayed away for another 14 years. I know how they thought... It was definitely the same guy, but it's kind of a rumor, because I don't know if the police ever straight up came out and said it, but there's a rumor that also on the, bar on the barn, there was, like, a smaller, lighter message about, like, did you find the shoe? Okay, I remember hearing a rumor about yeah. that on a podcast I listened to a while back. Yeah, so they think they were so confident that it was the same guy because of that message. So, who knows? Either way, like... Your daughter's dead, and then two years later, you're finding writing on a barn door about her. Like, that's so weird. Yeah, that's creepy. like... Like, this whole case just sounds like a horrifying, like, horror movie plot line. Like It does. Like, it really girl does. goes missing, is killed, killer taunts community for decades. Ugh. Don't um, like it. If you're on our YouTube, we'll post a picture of what the barn door looks like, but if you aren't, if you're listening on our podcast, you should look up what the barn 
door looks like. It is super, super, super creepy, and I can't get that mental image out of my head now. Mm-hmm. Okay, so like Kaylin says, nothing happens for like 14 years. But then, starting on March 25th of 2004, a series of notes start appearing at multiple residences where little girls lived in and near Fort Wayne, Indiana. Some were on little girls' bikes, and some were in mailboxes. All of the notes were on yellow-lined paper, and one of them read, Hi, honey. I've been watching you. I am the same person that kidnapped and raped and killed April Tinsley. You are my next victim. If you don't report this to police, and I don't see this in the paper tomorrow or on the local news 07, I will blow up your house. Yeah. And, uh, the note was also very childlike again, with misspelled words all up in it, and all the notes started with, hi, honey, and had, I've been watching you in it somewhere. And the police thought it could be a copycat, but the notes each included a gift. And out of the four notes that were collected, three came with a used condom inside with the killer's DNA that was matched and confirmed. And one of them, he decided to full on just taunt us and it was a Polaroid of a white male nude from the waist down, um, pleasing himself. So that's disgusting and I feel so bad for whatever poor family had to see that. But yeah, that's gross. Okay, we need to talk about these stupid notes real fast. First of all, hi, honey. I hate that. I hate I, that so, so much. It's just such a creepy verbiage to use. <laughs> and then, also, I will blow up your house. That's how he ends the message. I, have... I will blow up your house. Come, bro. Um, I hate him. <laughs> well, so at the time that these little goodie bags were getting delivered, because what they would do is, like, somebody's bike that they would just leave in their front yard who would go and like put these goodie bags on the little girls bikes and yeah and like these the ones in the mailboxes were not mailed like this dude straight up went to these people's houses and was on their property and thankfully somebody ended up seeing a vehicle that day and ended up reporting to the police that they saw a forest green van cruising around the neighborhood at the time of that happening so the police had a little bit of a lead to go off of at the same time and the handwriting on the notes matched the handwriting found on the barn. But I think one of the most craziest things is there is a 14 year gap in between the barn and these notes. 14 years pass and this man is still driving around doing stuff like this. Yeah, and a lot of people try to like think of why it took 14 years, but a lot of police think that maybe he was like, in jail or in a hospital in a mental institution like he got caught up and he just came back and was like yeah i'm back and everybody gonna know but and also something i heard on i think crime junkie was that when they were like analyzing the note one of them had like double underline something at the end and it was like the last note in the series that they found and I guess accountants like double underline whenever it's yeah. like the end of something on a paper and they were like well maybe he's an accountant but looking into the future that's giving this guy way too much credit <laughs> so that Polaroid that he took there was a very distinctive bedspread behind him super ugly bedspread but a very distinctive one and the police contacted like all the hotels in the area to see if they matched and of course they did not so the police believe that this photo was taken at his own house but let's just talk about how dumb this guy is it's 2004 now like we have a good idea of how dna and technology works and he just gave us like condoms filled with his dna in yeah. order to use plus a picture of himself from the waist down which is disgusting i'm sorry and like showed up on the scene this guy was begging to be caught i know so another few years go by, and of course the neighborhood felt super uneasy because this dude is just taunting them. And in 2009, the FBI offers their CARD team, and that stands for Child Abduction Rapid Deployment. And they bring in specialists into one room, including like behavioral analysis, uh, 
Crimes Against the Children Unit, coordinators from National Center for Analysis of Violent Crime, and representatives from the Violent Crime or the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. There's so many of the same words in different <coughs> orders. But anyways, all these smart people basically go in one room. They consist of 48 members organized in 10 teams in five regions around the country. And as of 2009, they have been deployed 38 times and aided in the recovery of 18 children. They usually respond to urgent non-family abductions, but also on cold cases if they believe there's enough evidence. So, they had their good DNA sample and they knew if they just held on to it, something could happen. And they believed that they could find the killer with police and they began drafting a updated detailed profile of the suspect. They released a statement saying their advantage is the amount of offender behavior spanning 16 years. Now, are you ready for this profile? Because it's detailed. It's a very long and detailed profile. They knew exactly who they were looking for, or what the person they were looking for was like. Mm -hmm. So, they said their suspect could be a preferential child sex offender, meaning he has a long-term desire for children and the interest will not go away. He may be married, but most of these offenders aren't. Men or may establish relationships that give him access to little girls. He's drawn to places where kids congregate and will stare at and maybe even approach kids in public. He offers company, or her prefers company of kids over adults and may be socially awkward or inappropriate around adults. May collect things that serve his sexual fantasies like pictures of little girls that he may take himself or collect from other sources. Continue may collect items that remind him of little girls, such as like Hello Kitty, Barbie dolls, anything. This type of offender can engage in many different criminal behaviors at different levels. If he has prior criminal history, it could be a child sex offense. There's been no activity since 2004, but he has had pauses in activity before in the 90s, which could be explained by, as I said before, I already said that. Okay. He has strong ties to Fort Wayne and either lives, works, or shops there. He is a white male, now 40 to 50 years old. May have a disorder called dysgraphia, which would like account for his illegible handwriting, poor spelling, bad spacing. And these people have trouble with thinking and writing at the same time. So then it looks like a mess. So yeah, that's our profile. Uh, yeah. They like, I mean, I feel like but that's every child sex offender though, also. Um, they also estimated that he had a low to medium income. I'm not sure if you already said that mm -hmm. one. They knew that he had borrowed a Polaroid camera or owned one in 2004, had hair on his lower legs, mm -hmm. and possibly owned or borrowed a forest screen pickup truck. Had hair on his lower legs, yeah, yes. don't we all? <laughs> like, literally, when I read that, I was like, I don't know why they put that in He had profile. very hairy legs, according <laughs> to that Polaroid. Gross. Ugh. So, the same year that the FBI released this profile, America's Most Wanted actually picked up the case, and they aired an episode on April's abduction and murder, which brought renewed interest into the case. And then, in 2012, they returned and made a follow-up episode, and police released additional information to the public about April's murder. They also spoke about that specific sex toy, which uh, Marina was talking about, that was found in the Sears bag, along with her body. And they had never spoken about it at the time until then, because they said it was so recognizable that somebody would be able to recognize it. However, those leads went nowhere, despite numbers of calls. Yeah, they also have revealed that they've had over 513 suspects, and as of 2009, they had narrowed it down to 81. That's still such a big number. Just think, there was that many creepy people living up in there. Seriously, like, I would yeah. not, I'm not ever going anywhere near Fort Wayne. <laughs> I want to, just for the creepy vibe. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so, also Janet agreed that the killer was probably local. She said it seemed too put together and that she thinks they could have done this before. Which, I mean, there are multiple cases that the police swear up and down aren't related, but I mean, there's... But then again, there's people everywhere. 
Also, another interesting thing that I don't think you have, um, after April's funeral, police took the guest book, and after a while, Janet was like, I want that book back, and it was nowhere to be found. But then, suddenly, copies of it show up with only the family signatures on it. And there are, like, over 200 people there. And, like, there were so many pages missing. And they only had the copies of their family signatures. So, I, I just think that was weird. I don't know why they did that. Like, maybe they really looked into, like, every single person that went in there. Alright, do you have anything else to add before we get to Parabon Nano Labs? Oh, that one guy that, um, after one of the... America's Most Wanted shows aired, there was a call that came in, and this dude was like, I think my dad is the killer. <laughs> and listen to why he thinks it, okay. He lived really close to the crime scene, he had a history of child molestation, he owned a Polaroid and would say hi honey and haha a lot, had blue pickup, and a few days after April's murder, he painted the truck. Uh, police questioned him and he claimed he never met April but his daughter played with her and he knew of her. He said he was working that day but police followed up with the employer and he hadn't worked that whole weekend that this whole shit went down. And so they searched his home and found a yellow notebook and a Polaroid but the DNA was not a match. But like that sounds... Like Isn't that crazy? I almost feel like I would trust all that like circumstantial evidence over the DNA. But, I mean, I guess not. But. but at the end of the day, it all brings me back to that one lady that said she saw that truck with multiple men in it. Yeah. This could be, like, I think a two to three guy operation. Okay, we'll, like, retouch on that whenever we get yeah. to the story. Because I have so many theories about that. Okay, so, get into your Parabon. Oh, you probably have way more detailed Parabon stuff than I have. Or did you not? I mean, we could. <laughs> I don't have a lot on it. Basically, in 2015, Parabon Nanolabs, 2016, <laughs> Parabon Nanolabs released a new composite sketch. The original DNA sample left on April's body had been used up over the years, but because the killer left fresh samples in his notes, the lab had more than enough DNA to play with. Um, y'all, these new composite sketches are a bazillion times better than the last ones. It doesn't even look like the same person. And we have what we believe the guy looked like at the time of the abductions, as well as an aged version of it of how we believe he looks now. Do you want me to insert my little science geeky nerd how yes, this happened? <laughs> okay. So, all right. So, Parabon Nano Labs. I did a whole, if y'all are listening, I did a whole school project on y'all. I would love to work for y'all one day. But anyways, <laughs> anyways. Um, there's this one service that they have called Parabon Snapshot, and it's, I should have said this, it's a lab located in Virginia. Uh, they do advanced DNA analysis, they do genetic genealogy, which they identify a subject by searching for relatives in public databases and building family trees, and a lot of this is possible because of things like Ancestry, 23andMe, like all of those samples are up for grabs, like in a crime case, I guess, basically. And they also do phenotyping, which is predicting physical appearance and ancestry of an unknown person from DNA. Um, and they say on their website, Snapchat is ideal for generating investigative leads, narrowing suspect lists, and solving human remain cases without wasting time and money chasing false leads. So like, I don't know, You've taken a biology class in your life before, right? Yeah. We've taken the basis of biology, most of us. I would hope you know how life works, but, okay, so your DNA, you have all your genes, all your alleles, like, that mean different things, you know? I'm trying to, like, really dumb it down because, like, I'm not even that smart when it comes to this stuff, <laughs> but, okay. So basically, like, they can tell so much from your DNA, like, just different I mean y'all probably know what I'm saying I'm trying to make it too complicated <laughs> DNA markers yeah we're all very unique so like it's easy to like it's like a big puzzle once you piece back the family tree and like figure out who all the possible suspects are you just kind of like figure it out I don't know how else to say it and genealogy testing has just helped with solving so 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 many cases because 
if I or anybody or let's say my DNA is not in the system at all, so they can never link something back to me. If like my uncle or something had his DNA in the system, they could use that in order to link it back to me. So it just opens up so many more opportunities that are for things that aren't already in CODIS. Yeah. So using that DNA testing, they narrowed it, the profile down to that of two brothers. One which was living in Grabille, Indiana, just 15 miles away from Fort Wayne, where the two notes were found. His name was John Miller. He was 59 years old. Yep. And Parabon found... Okay, so basically how it happened with this specific case is Parabon found distant cousins and built family tree backwards, then looked for the descendants and narrowed the search down to those two brothers. And it had to be one of them because they were both carrying the right mix of DNA from their ancestors to fit the profile. And then... A few days later, after the police got their match, they they did the same thing they did to the Golden State Killer, and I love that. Like, they went to this dude's trash, got DNA, and matched it, then boom, you get that on your door. They also got his DNA again from used condoms in his trash can. Ew. Like, <laughs> ew. This dude is so gross. Like... They had finally found April's killer years and years and years after the abduction. Yes, July 15th, 2018 was the oh-so-holy day. So 30 years. Yeah. That is ridiculous. 30 years that her family waited for justice. Yeah. It is crazy. But, like, science. Well, Miller was arrested at his trailer, and during interviews at the station, he later ends up confessing to the murder. Though... Miller initially pleaded not guilty to the charges. He ended up retracting that plea and was sentenced to 80 years in prison on the 7th of December, 2018. He did not get sentenced to the death penalty, however, which caused outrage within April's family and the larger community of Fort Wayne. However, his age and health conditions would unlikely let him see the end of his sentence, let alone execution, so it really didn't matter either way. He now resides in Newcastle Correctional Facility in Indiana, where he'll stay until his earliest release in 2058, when he'll be almost 100 years old. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. But basically, okay, so, did you see that, like, whenever the police knocked on his door, they, like, just straight up said, do you know why we're here? And he just said, April Tinsley. Like, that was, like, his one and only victim. That is so weird. It is so, I mean, I guess, fortunate that there was only one from him. But, like... But also, I, like, saw some, like, news videos of, like, the community when the whole trial was going around. So, let's see. His lawyer said that John wishes it never happened and is sorry, but showed no remorse in court. Because, like, he wasn't allowed to talk in court, I don't think, because of his mental state. Like, they wheeled him in in a wheelchair even though he could walk but they basically just wanted to control him <laughs> yeah i think and um he took the plea deal because it was best for the case because of course everyone wanted to go for the death penalty but when you go for a death penalty you have to have a trial and that trial was going to be so drawn out and like so many of the witnesses were elderly or dead now so they were like the best thing for like everyone involved was to just take a plea deal because even with a plea deal, this dude's going to get so many years, he's going to die in jail. And, like, even if he was sentenced to the death penalty, they were saying, like, in the state of Indiana, they're lucky if they can get that done in 30 years. Yeah. So, he's going to die in jail. It's just kind of unfortunate that he's still living right now. Basically. <sighs> well, in the Hoagland Masterson neighborhood, April's Memorial Garden is still alive and well today. They made her a memorial garden. It's filled with flowers and benches, and it's a place to sit and contemplate for those who remember her and passers-by. I know. Every, like, the whole community was so happy that day he was arrested. There was just, like, chalk all over the sidewalks. So many tears of joy. So, since this was, like, solved, like, relatively recently, I can literally remember hearing whenever they ended up catching this guy. Because I remember yeah. listening to the case and being like, God, this guy's still out there, this is crazy, and then yeah. finding it out. Because, like, at the time, I think, because I got hooked on Crime Junkie, 
like they had already put out a good few episodes but it was still in the middle like they hadn't found this killer yet so when i heard this one update about they found the killer i'm like oh my god and like this parabon nanolabs they're solving a lot more cold cases like like i don't know why this has been like hidden so long like is technology just now getting that good? Like, I don't get it. Like, it sounds like this is so simple, but I guess it's now that more people have their DNA in the databases that it's getting easier. Yeah. Maybe that's why. But I don't know. That's why your girl's a biologist. I'm taking genetics this semester. <laughs> Hit me up. Have fun with that. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. You got anything else? That's about it. I have so many questions, though, about all these other suspects that they saw, and these know. other people that are so... Like, I feel like if we have him, did he just not tell us everything else? Like, would he not have admitted that maybe there's other people, or would he... I don't know. Maybe it's, he has some kind of, like, mental thing, and they're like, we're not gonna believe a word this guy says. Like, nothing he says we can, like, yeah. take for the truth. I don't know. Um... Also, fuck, I was thinking of something else, but then I totally lost my train of thought. What's new? <laughs> oh, they had tested over, like, they sent over 400 DNA samples in to get matched to his. And, like, think of, like, thinking you've got the guy 400 times. <laughs> That's gotta feel, like, defeating. It does. But I'm so glad, like, the investigators in that case, like, one of them said they kept April's picture on his desk for, like, the whole 30 years, and they interviewed him at the courthouse whenever he was sentenced, and he's like, that picture comes down today. I did my job. I'm like, yeah, you did. That's gonna be such a crazy feeling, investigating a case for 30 years, and it's finally solved. Mm -hmm. I look, he wanted to be an investigator, too, one day, but, like, also not trying to get killed on the job. Yeah. <laughs> Cause like I'd be getting too nosy. I'd go somewhere I'm not supposed to be and get killed off right For as there. As I am of everything, I like I've always wanted to do that. Dude, I'm so thankful, dude. I, when's the last episode I didn't talk about Prison Break? <laughs> but I'm so thankful for that show because I think like Michael Schofield in every situation now, like. Where's my exits? What can I use that as my defense weapon? Like, ain't nobody abducted me. Try me. All right, y'all. Well, that about wraps it up for today. Unless, did you have anything else to add? Uh, rest in peace, April Tinsley. My love goes out to the whole Tinsley family. Um. Indeed. Also, I want y'all to sign that petition for Jessica Easterly's case. Um, I'll link it in all of our social medias that we post this one. I'll, it'll be in the description. Because the New Orleans DA keeps saying they're going to investigate this. They're investigating. But, like, the family keeps, like, pushing people to sign this petition. And I haven't heard any updates. So, like, I want these mofos to do their job and investigate and, like, give this family some peace. So, it'll be linked. Sign it. It takes one minute. Absolutely, y'all. All right. Well, thank y'all, as always, for listening. And we will see y'all next week, next two weeks, yeah. <laughs> with a brand new episode. Y'all stay woke. Bye.